compromise. There's a world of requirements that can never be met of an unrelenting series of demands. In such a world, the practical in the sense of the moral outruns the attainable, leading to an impractical philosophy of the practical. So basically what I want to talk about is how to be practical about the practical. Meaning by the practical, get sensible results on the one hand, and on the other hand, the practical in the sense that Kant was talking about practical, namely the critique of practical reason, in other words, the critique of morality. So morality and results, and, the, and how the two hang together. The romantic lineage of this trend of thought runs through Fichte, Royce, Levinas, and our, in our own day, Sammy Pilstrom in a couple of his recent books. Sammy is a lovely Finn, a melancholy Finn, I call him, uh, because, because his very thought is one of being defeated in morality. No matter how much you do, you'll see this in a minute, no matter how much you do, you're doing too little. All right. Uh, their, okay, uh, the, their idea is that all evil must be overcome. Since this is impossible, the entire moral enterprise is a failure. One would think that such a conclusion would occasion a revaluation of the premises. But no, this failure and the painful recognition of it are declared the glory of morality. The glory of morality. We are to sacrifice ourselves for a noble cause without hope of ever succeeding. Morality, it is supposed, demands daily crucifixion, right? And worse, because the original crucifixion settled the score with sin once and for all, while the torture inflicted on us by continuing failure is a masochist paradise. Let me take a second and tell you why this bothers me so. Uh, there's an untold amount of evil in the world. Uh, every time you try to do something, uh, y you do it at the cost of, of something awful. Uh, you, you try to feed somebody, and in order to feed somebody, some, some creature had to be slaughtered. And that's not good. Uh, so how is there, how is it possible, and that's my theme, how is it possible for human beings who are finite to take on an infinite task? That's the question. And the answer I want to give is that it's impossible to do that. And the only result that you get if you try to take it on is the result of failure and eventually total discouragement. Now, total discouragement is a terrible thing in a moral life uh, because there's so much to do we ought to do at least our share even even half our share the idea of being discouraged because the task is infinite and we never make any headway is a disaster supposing that finite persons have infinite obligations does not embolden the moral impulse instead it conveys a message of failure and a melancholy sense of futility. If evil is limitless, taking it on is a fool's errand. The temptation is to promote our own good because with a bit of luck and for a time, that is something at which we can succeed. In this way, the moral begets the immoral. Since we cannot go and do enough good, we settle for doing what we can complete. So let me, let me be sure that I'm making the point so you, you see it. Uh, the moral begets the immoral in the following way. Uh, we feel that we can't do enough. There's always more to do. You can't sleep. Uh, you, uh, you're, you're in a position where you're constantly hounding yourself. Uh, I hope you, you don't have that problem, but obviously Sami Pilstrom does, and a number of others, and certainly philo philosophers did and do. Uh, now the question is, uh, how will you, how will it be able, how will you be able to, to, to come away with anything here? Well, the only thing I can come away with 
uh, once says, is that I can pursue my own good. Uh, I can eliminate the evil that surrounds me. Uh, that's not really the best form of the moral life. Uh, that kind of egoism is, uh, uh, is, just, is, is, is just exactly the kind of immorality that comes out of the morality that we impose on people. The recent growth of sensitivity to the sensitiveness of others, sensitiv double sensitivity, sensitivity to the sensitiveness of others, has greatly contributed to the list of evils to combat. Some people demand compensation for what happened to their ancestors. Others refused to eat meat and use animal products. Nothing that can be construed as offensive must ever leave our lips. On college campuses, this is the best, I like this. On college campuses, teachers must warn their students that what they study might upset them. Come on. <laughs> if it doesn't upset them, you failed as an educator. I mean, how, how, will, how will they be in a position to rethink, uh, rethink reality, rethink their opinions, rethink how they relate to the world, unless uh, they're in a position to be upset? Uh, feeding, ev feeding everyone, including those who cho choose not to work, is a momentous task by itself. Equalizing incomes, as is the presumed requirement of so-called social justice, makes the task impossible. Why can't the requirements of the moral life be more modest? Why can't we rest after a day's work and feel that what we did was enough? It will, of course, be less than needs to, what needs to be done. But doing more is what tomorrow is for. To set a realistic goal enables us to experience completion, a victory of sorts. After a good night's rest, we can do more. And because what we did was enough and good enough, there's no need to feel guilty. So that's, that seems to me to be a crucial point. Uh, you want to eliminate the constant feeling of guilt that is so successfully used by people to manipulate us. I, don't, I see no reason why we should feel guilty if we've done enough and, and good enough in any given day. Uh, but there are people who are suffering and it's only midnight. Well, okay, then in that case, um, have some sleep. Have some sleep because tomorrow you'll help them. Because this argument goes on forever. The argument of... Uh, let me see if it's only midnight, I could do some good. It's only one o'clock, I could do some good. It's only, it's only two o'clock, I could do the same, I could do more. Uh, it's a disaster. It's a disaster not only for the individual through its guilt, through his or her guilt, but also a disaster uh, for uh, the moral life. All right, some thinkers believe it's shameful to settle for what is good enough. In their view, no amount of effort is enough and no performance is good enough when it comes to combating evil. But it is doubtful that dissatisfaction with our best exertions can goad us to do more and better. The likely result is subjective, darkening our days with ineffective self-criticism and ill-focused complaints, forcing ourselves to try to do more than what is enough and good enough, comes in the end, becomes in the end destructive of human life. The, word, the world is not improved if we add the pain of self-punishment to the misery that surrounds us. The psychology behind this perfectionism is fundamentally flawed, creating frustration, guilt, and a brooding sense of impotence. I, I can't uh, stress enough this notion of the brooding sense of impotence, of we can't do enough, but we must do more, and we must do more, and we must do more. And this is uh, something that, in my opinion, certainly in my case, destroys human life, destroys the possibility of satisfaction, uh, and, and 
and does so in the name of the good. That's what's weird. It does so in the name of the good. My wife and I live in the hills in a city with ample green spaces. We are visited by rabbits, possums, raccoons, deer, squirrels, chipmunks, dozens of species of birds, and creatures whose identity is difficult to determine. What obligations do we owe these creatures? Except for an occasional hawk and owl, predators have been largely eliminated and the woods are overpopulated. Our first approximation to an answer to this question was to put out what was left after dinner. By the way, let me tell you one of the great grievances that I have over civilized, concerning civilized life, and I don't have many, but this is one, uh, is the idea that over 45% of the food we use is dumped. And it's not, it's not given to those who could use it. It's not given to feed animals. It's simply destroyed, and I think that's, that's a tragedy. It's an, it's an unmistakable tragedy. So the first uh, approximation to the question was put out some of what was left after dinner. There was meat among the scraps, which was promptly discovered and gulped by a large turkey vulture. Now, I don't know if you know about turkey vultures. You probably don't. About that size, wingspan larger than mine, black, ugly, <laughs> but in, in, in their ugliness, rather attractive. I, yeah. Does that make any sense <laughs> to you? you know? And they got these great big nasty beaks, but once you get to know them, they're, they're really quite all right. You know? <laughs> it's not true that only their mom could like them. <laughs> all right, so um, uh, that, uh, he gulps it, or she gulps it, we don't know. Seeing hunger, a terrible sight, we started buying meat and, and for the vulture. He or she, in turn, invited his cousins to dinner, and they graciously accepted. We have not even an elementary understanding of the systems of communication within species of animals. In a few days, we, we had 22 turkey vultures roosting on our roof. <laughs> Soiling the house and the driveway as they waited for dinner. I swear to you, they waited for dinner. There is a lesson here for those who want to take over the lives of others. It was clear that the system we created was unsustainable. We could not continue to host an ever-expanding flock of large birds. Were we obligated to try? And if we decided not to feed them, should we feel guilty when, we looked, when they looked on with hungry eyes when we ate dinner? We have a wall right past our uh, uh, dining area, and they knew immediately where to go, uh, where they could stare the food out of our hands and our <laughs> mouths, you know, just kind of looking like this. And I mean, how can you be eating when we're not eating? No joking matter. They were hungry. The dismissive, they are only animals, cannot be taken seriously. Suffering, whoever bears it, is an immediate evil and must not be overlooked. The birds we, we were in need, but it was impossible to take on the task of daily feedings. Painful days followed. We hoped the birds would realize dinner was not to be, not, would not be served and revert to whatever means of survival they employed before they had come on the scene. They did. But we noticed that a couple birds didn't take off with the flock. This represents, presented an opportunity. Turkey vultures don't like to fly in the dark. So two laggards, the two laggards, could be fed without danger of attracting the rest. That has been our pattern ever since. Wait until dark and then feed two birds. We see that others, the others, here and there in the neighborhood, especially where a car had hit and killed an animal. But they're not our daily responsibility. Perhaps you can see now what I mean by finite responsibility for finite agents. I'm recommending a practical approach to the practical. Following such a philosophy enables us to get more 
out of more, more of the work of morality and more of the work of morality done than the hankering after the infinite that commits us to wanting to fix everything. And very important, one of its benefits is that it provides a better life for moral agents. So don't forget it's important for you to have a, a better life also. It's not all self-sacrifice. It would be terrible if we could only gain the satisfaction of those who need the satisfaction at the cost of our dissatisfaction. I think finite beings require finite obligations. And I, that, that is what I call a practical approach to the practical. Thank you. All right, let's, let's try this. Don't, don't put it too close. <laughs>